So I thought I would just do a little video talking off the top of my head because I've been watching videos of other watchmen on YouTube who have been kind of discouraged, some of them, because they were really expecting a Passover rapture and that didn't happen. So now they're looking to second Passover, looking to Pentecost. And, and part of the pressure and um, discouragement that is starting to come on different watchmen and people who are following uh, channels like this is that we're getting to the end of the uh, 70 to 80 year time frame when you know Christ needs to return at the end of a seven year tribulation and so um, you know if you do the math and stuff <laughs> and, uh, it, and you believe in a seven year tribulation um, which is the wrath of God according to people who have this um, understanding is that we we need to have a rapture pretty soon otherwise that whole fig tree prophecy that people talk about from Matthew 24 probably won't be true. Now I've done lots and lots of videos and I'm just going to kind of be repeating myself on this one but I hope you'll bear with me and just listen to what I have to say. That I think that the fig tree prophecy is true that there is going to be a 70 to 80 year window when Israel becomes a nation and then there's this window of 70 to 80 years, a generation, and at the end of that, Christ will return. And I, I firmly believe that's true. I think we're still well in the window of that. We wouldn't need to have a rapture until 2023, or some people would say 2024. I tend to think that 2023 would be the latest year for that. But people will go, well, how can you have a seven-year tribulation if um, and still stay within that 1948 window uh, where Christ has to return by um, 2028? So adding 80 years to 1948 brings you to 2028. So we have that. That's the upper limit for the fig tree generation. And God does use that generational length of time. He's used it two times before, back in Daniel with that 70 um, years of captivity, 70 years of Babylon. And then he did it again around the time of Christ, uh, when Christ was born. And then by 70 AD, we had the destruction of Jerusalem and the uh, dispersion of the Jews throughout the world, the temples destroyed, and so that sort of puts the, an end to the, um, that was sort of the upper limit of, uh, you know, the, that generation that started basically with the star of Bethlehem and the wise men and ended with uh, the Romans coming in and destroying the city. So God does use that 70 to 80 year um, generational time frame when he is doing a work and that's a pretty good firm pattern of scripture and that's kind of what I'm looking at I'm looking for patterns uh, prophecy is fulfilled in patterns so one of the things I think is really important to understand is you have to have a good foundation for your eschatology in order for everything you build on that foundation to actually be solid. So a few years ago, uh, after the Revelation 12 sign came and went in 2017 and we weren't raptured, it never occurred to me at the time that uh, we were looking for the sign of the dragon, which is a whole separate sign the rapture, the catching away of the, the child in that second sign, the sign of the dragon, that's, that's where the rapture takes place. It takes place within that sign, not the first sign, which was just a heads up that stuff is starting to happen. Um, that also fell on the 70th anniversary of Israel being a nation. I was pretty disappointed, as many people were, but I don't give up that easily, and so I decided to just go kind of to square one. Let's just start looking at Revelation. It's the book that nobody's looking at. Everybody's adding up numbers and going to Daniel and looking for gematria and doing all this stuff, and I've been doing some of that too, and I just went, you know what? <laughs> I think the answer is in the book of Revelation, and so... Part of me just said, you know what, I know what other people teach because I, I'm familiar with it. I know what they, what's out there. And um, 
and I there's holes in all of it. And so I'm just going to just start, square one. So along the way, I asked this question, okay, so people talk about a pre-trib rapture, mid-trib, post-trib. It's all about the tribulation. The tribulation is when the wrath of God is poured out on the world. Uh, the tribulation lasts seven years. There's all this, um, what I call kind of mythology, built around a seven-year tribulation equals the wrath of God. And I've done numerous videos on this in the past. If you're going to have a doctrine that you're basing a rapture on, like the tribulation, a seven-year tribulation, you better have a verse to back that up. All right, so that's what I did. I went on the hunt to find a verse. I'm thinking to myself, I don't know of any any verse, any passage that says that there's seven years of, of wrath. I, I don't know of any verse that says that. And I don't know of any verse that, say, that says there's seven years of tribulation or a verse that says that tribulation and wrath are the same thing. And so I just thought, well, you know, I got Google. I'm just going to search this. Uh, a verse that you know <laughs> clearly spells out we have seven years of tribulation equals wrath. And it's not there. Okay, there is no verse. Now, people will say, oh, but Daniel 9, 27, that talks, you know, the 70th week of Daniel, that's seven years long. Yes, it is. Okay, the 70th week of Daniel is seven years long. It's divided into two halves. We know that Israel is going to have 42 months of tribulation. That's very clear from Revelation, from Daniel, uh, when Daniel asked the angel in Revelation 12, how long will these troubles be that Israel is going to be in? And it's for time, times, and half a time. The, the remnant of Israel flee into the wilderness 1,260 days, or time, times, and half a time. The reign of the beast is 42 months. Okay, so all of that is pretty clear, that there's going to be three and a half years that Israel is going to have issues. Okay, but what about that first three and a half years? Okay, so if we look at the 70th week of Daniel, we look at uh, Daniel 9, 27, all we have is someone confirming a covenant, and at the end of that, sacrifice and offering ceases. And people go, well, sacrifice and offering ceasing, ceasing that's the abomination of desolation. Is it? <laughs> okay, Daniel 9 is talking about how God is going to put away Israel's sin. Israel has a sin and rebellion problem. How is God going to end that? Okay, he's going to end it through Christ. He's going to make an end to sacrifice and offering. That's what Christ did. After he died, sacrifice and offering, they put an end to that. In fact, the veil in the temple was torn in two. That was God's exclamation point on, yes, sacrifice and offering. It's all done. It's finished. So that first part of Daniel's 70th week, that first three and a half years, I'm convinced was the life and ministry of Christ three and a half years long. And this is not my idea. I, I'm not the first person to think this. This is actually in commentaries, in old commentaries, where people who were scholars would say, yeah, this is Christ who came and confirmed God's covenant with his people. So I have a video series that I've done on the Messiah in Daniel. And I hope you'll take a look at that. I'm going to leave a link to that in the description box. But what this said to me, okay, as I'm studying end times, I'm like, you know what? This whole foundation is flawed. There isn't a seven-year wrath. There isn't a seven-year period. That cannot be proven from scripture. We have three and a half years for sure, and then we have a certain amount of time before that when uh, Satan will be cast out of heaven, when the harlot is going to persecute believers, when um, actually the first rapture is going to take place uh, before the seals and the trumpets can begin, and that all is true. But they're called birth pangs in the Gospel of Matthew. And I hope you will look at this other video series that I've done where I've placed the seals of Revelation in Matthew 24. They fit in there absolutely beautifully, perfectly. 
If there isn't a passage that says there's seven years of tribulation, chances are there might not be seven years. There is three and a half years for sure, and then however much is before that, well, that's the question. Okay, so one of the problems we have when we read uh, prophecy, especially Old Testament prophecy and Revelation, which is written in that Old Testament prophetic style. And we tend to like to view things in a rather linear and, you know, more logical way. But, but that is not how you do prophecy. Prophecy is not, you can't read it like that. And so um, I showed in my video series on the Messiah in Daniel, there's the first coming and the second coming that are in Daniel chapter 9, and they're again in Daniel 12. Both the first coming and the second coming are in both of those chapters. Now you go, well, how can that be? How can that be? Shouldn't it all be about the second coming or, or you know, isn't that what it's all about? Well, no. <laughs> Let me show you from some other passages of scripture. So here's the, the classic one that a lot of people point out. I've pointed this one out before. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Okay. When Jesus came the first time, I believe he came during a Jubilee year. He's setting at liberty those who are captives. That the 70th week of Daniel began when Jesus began his ministry. Baptized on Yom Kippur, which if it's a Jubilee year, that's when the Jubilee would be proclaimed. Now, they couldn't do Jubilee. They were under Roman occupation. Um, none of that could be done. But when Jesus taught his very first sermon, um, in I think it's Luke chapter 4, this is the passage he used. But he only read up to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He didn't say in the day of vengeance of our God. Okay, the day of vengeance of our God is second coming. Okay, the year of the Lord's favor was when Jesus came the first time. The year of vengeance or the day of vengeance of our God uh, is a whole nother thing. That's, you know, the second part of the second coming of Christ. Okay, here's another one that I want to read to you. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Uh, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on an ass, on a colt, the foal of an ass. Verse 10. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Okay, we know that that first part, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king comes to you riding on a donkey. Palm Sunday. That's when Jesus came riding on a donkey. When he cuts off the chariots and the war horses from Jerusalem and commands peace to the nation and his dominion is from sea to sea, that's the second coming of Christ. Okay, verse 9, first coming, verse 10, second coming. Let me show you this again in Zechariah. Zechariah 13, uh, verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, says the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third through the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. All right, here is another passage. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered. That's a prophecy of when Jesus was taken into custody and the sheep, the disciples, were scattered. But when we look at verse 8, in the whole land two-thirds will be cut off and perish and one-third shall be left alive. This is not talking about the first coming. This is talking about the second coming of Christ. All right, so this third will be refined as silver is refined, and so on and so forth. All right, so when we look at prophecy, really any kind of prophecy, there isn't a linear time thing that happens, 
This is true in Daniel, which is especially Daniel 9 and Daniel 12, where there's going to be a jump from second coming of Christ to the first coming and from the first coming of Christ to the second coming. So if you're interested in knowing what are the 1,335 days or the 1,290 days of Daniel chapter 12, that's the first coming of Christ. You have to look at my video and I have a an article that I've written that goes along with that video that can show you how this pertains to the first coming of Christ and really how everybody um, who knew this passage in Daniel could have been made aware of the exact day that Christ came and the exact day when the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all flesh, right? That would be 1,335 days after the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, that's when Pentecost is, 1,335 days after the Feast of Trumpets, from the baptism of John to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I guess the bottom line for me is, look, you've got to go back to your foundations. And just because somebody you trust and love has said this is true, does not mean it's true. And if they can't produce a verse for you that says there's seven years of tribulation and tribulation is wrath, which they can't because there isn't one, Okay, and I've put that challenge out there many times in my videos. If you know of a verse that says there's seven years of tribulation or seven years of wrath, okay, something that's as important as this, where we ba we're basing whole eschatologies on the idea of seven years of wrath or seven years of tribulation, there better be a verse for that, and it better be clear. That's what I'm saying. Your hermeneutic needs to be consistent. A hermeneutic is a Bible study method. So, for example, in the book of Revelation, if I were to ask somebody who wants to take the Bible literally, who actually believes in inductive Bible study, is the 1,260 days that the woman flees a literal 1,260 days? And most people will say yes. So is the 42-month reign of the beast a literal 42 months? They're going to say Yes. What about the five months that the uh, locust army, whatever, tortures people? Is that a literal five months? They'll say yes. What about the three and a half days that the two witnesses uh, lie in the streets of, of Jerusalem? Is that a literal three and a half days? They'll say yes. Okay, now let's look at Revelation chapter 2. What about the ten days of tribulation that believers are going to suffer? Is that a literal 10 days or is that 10 years or what are they? Okay, you get my drift here. That if you want to have a consistent hermeneutic and you believe that all the other days of Revelation are literal, the 10 days in Revelation chapter 2 better be literal too. And this is one of the big, uh, was a big red flag for me when I used to think that we're talking about church history and that the 10 days was 10 years and I'm like okay if you start doing that in Revelation chapter 2 you open up this whole can of worms that says we can do a day to year conversion for all the rest of this and I don't think that that makes any sense at all so I decided I'm going to set aside that whole deal of this is church history and I'm going to take the letters to the seven churches as well as Revelation chapter 1 and I'm going to act as though it all applies to the very end, that the actual interpretation of the letters to the seven churches applies to the end times, that it isn't something that we just write off as so, you know, the letter to the church at Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum, that all of these are ancient history and they don't have any application for what's coming. Okay, I think that they have plenty of application for what's coming. So I've started a Bible study on Revelation the book of Revelation chapter by chapter, but because I understand that Revelation is not chronological. It's not built on the foundation of chapters 1, 2, and 3. It actually starts in the middle with Revelation 12. That is the foundation for the book of Revelation. It lays out a whole sequence of time markers that every other chapter of Revelation can find its home within these time markers. If this spring and summer goes by and we're not raptured, I hope you will remember this video.
rethink your foundation, rethink your premises. It's, it's like a math problem. If you get the answer wrong, you go back and you check your addition. You check what you did. You check your equation. You, you recheck it all and see if there's any holes here. And the other thing is you need to think differently and you need to get new information into the system. If you continue with the same information and you go over it over and over again and you don't put anything new in that system, you're not going to get anything different than what you already have. And I realize this is extremely uncomfortable for a lot of people. And especially when they, they have this eschatology that they firmly believe in, uh, to think anything different is extremely uncomfortable. But it doesn't have to be. You can hold on to that stuff you're believing and at the same time ask some questions and explore other avenues. We can still be within that fig tree generation if we don't rapture until 20. Uh, 23 and I suppose technically till 2024 the only solid portion of that seven years that has to do with Israel is the three and a half years the 42 months reign of the beast the three and a half years of time times and half a time the 1260 days very very clear in scripture what that last period is about but you'll notice that there isn't anything solid about that first part you know, what we would say the first three and a half years of the tribulation. We don't actually know how long that time is. Revelation gives us clues about that. And I believe in a pre-seal, pre-trumpet rapture, before the seals are open, before the trumpets are blown, we're going to be out of here. I believe that. But it's not at the beginning of a seven-year process. And there is no Antichrist who's going to be confirming a covenant and then at the end of three and a half years stopping sacrifice and offering at the temple of a rebuilt temple. That is not, that's not what that story is all about, okay? Uh, oh, one more thing is this whole idea of defining terms in the Bible. I want to look at one more thing. This is the, the passage in Titus that talks about our blessed hope. What's really mystifying to me is that so many people call the rapture the blessed hope. And they get it from this passage here. And let's just look at it, okay? This is another example. So this is Titus 2, and we're going to start at verse 11. And I'm going to show you this is not talking about the rapture, okay? We have a blessed hope, but the rapture isn't it. For the grace of God has appeared for the salvation of of all men, training us to renounce irreligion and worldly passions and to live sober, upright, and godly lives in this world, awaiting our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior is the visible return of Christ when he puts down the beast and the false prophet and, you know, at Armageddon. That's the glorious appearing. That is, you actually see him. This is not a secret coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the uh, manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The grace of God first manifested itself at Christ's first coming. And here he's going to manifest again in glory at the second coming of Christ. Don't just believe the what people say. Look at the passages yourself. Do a little study. Go to Bible Hub or, you know, eSword or whatever and look at what the words mean. And by the way, I've done a whole video series on defining our terms. Tribulation, the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, being gathered together. Um, these are just some of the phrases and words that People don't really know what they mean, and so they're, they're used in a very loose way, sort of like the generation we're living in now where a thing is not the thing, okay, where you can define anything the way you feel like defining it, and the Bible is very technical about some of these words. So look them up and know what they mean, and then don't just gloss over it. Be willing to change your mind about some of these things. Okay, so I'm done. Rant off, and uh, we'll see you on another video. <laughs> Till then, pray you'll have a very blessed day.